emotionally intelligent communication in 14 minutes. An introduction to how emotionally intelligent communication will help you to free yourself from the effects of past experiences and cultural conditioning, break patterns of thinking that lead to arguments, anger and depression, resolve conflicts peacefully, whether personal or public, create a family structure that supports everyone's needs being met, develop relationships based on mutual respect, compassion and cooperation, but most of all, have more health and happiness, not just you, but also the people you care about the most. Where does it all go wrong? Mum says, how was school? Her 14 year old son shouts and spits at her, stamping on the ground and windmilling with his arms, for bleep's sake, mother, leave me alone. <sighs> what on earth just happened? How would you feel in that situation? How would you react? And what about his response? Well, it was a reaction, wasn't it? It was automatic and well rehearsed. You may depend this wasn't the first time he'd reacted in a similar way. Well, it's a true story and we'll come back to it later. Meanwhile, what is emotionally intelligent communication? Well, it's a way of listening and it's a way of talking, that's all. Why might you be interested? Well, if you've ever felt misunderstood or that no one cares, if you've ever felt you just can't get through to someone, then emotionally intelligent communication is just what you need. How do we get it? Well, first we look at the ways that tend to go wrong now when we communicate and then we learn an easy four-step process as an alternative. In fact, it's so easy, the most difficult thing about it is letting go of the old way of doing things, which, let's face it, we've been practicing for decades, haven't we? So what does that mean? It means everybody gets what they need. After all, it wouldn't work if only one party succeeded in getting what they wanted. That would be manipulation, and that's not going to work for long. When everybody gets what they need, everybody gets more peace and more love in their lives and everybody's happy. And it's not just at home. Developing your emotional intelligence has a massive benefit to you personally at work and also to the company that you work for. It's been discovered that in all jobs, in every field, Having emotional competence is twice as important as having purely cognitive ability, a high IQ, in other words. What's more, emotional competence accounts for nearly all the advantage to be had for both personal and company success. In a landmark study in 1990, it was reckoned that emotional competence really comes into its own the more complex the job is. So, for example, doctors and lawyers were able to bring an added value in financial terms of 27% compared to average performers. Now, they weren't even comparing them with bottom performers, but average ones, and still they outperformed them by an extra 27%. Employees with emotional intelligence recognize and can comfortably talk about their strengths and limitations they actively seek out constructive criticism and act on it to improve their performance. They're self-confident and likely to ask for help rather than struggle on their own. The risks they take are calculated risks and are less likely to cause problems at work but to solve them. So what causes us to behave in a less emotionally intelligent way then, in, in a less evolved way? Well, it's an automatic survival instinct to try to control our environment and, and therefore other people. We want other people to do what we want them to do because it makes us feel safe. We know where we are then. Consequently, we use a language of control. We say things like, you should get to work on time or you should brush your teeth before going to bed. We say, I must get to the shops today 
or I must get at least two more clients by the end of the year. That insidious level of control is there in our everyday language and we don't even realise we're doing it. So we accuse other people. You always leave the lid up. You never put the seat down. Every time I go into the bathroom, whenever you've been in there, and of course, these are generalisations. Is it really true, absolutely every solitary time that you go into the bathroom, dot, 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 or are you generalising? Are you really focusing on the here and now, or are you using history to build a case? <laughs> are you also referring to their previous crimes? We're also enthusiastic mind readers. We think we know why somebody did something. We think we know what they're thinking. We'll say something like, He's so lazy because he just doesn't care. I'm not saying for one moment that there's a right way and a wrong way to speak. I am saying that our everyday language comes at a price because when we make judgments and generalizations and mind reads, the other person hears insults, criticism, judgments and blame. If someone talks to you like that, how would you feel? How would you respond? A typical response might be to defend yourself. That's not fair. I don't always leave the lid up. Or they might withdraw from the conversation and from us. They might go quiet or even walk away and sometimes while we're still talking to them. Or they might attack us in return. They might say something like, you're worse than I am. <laughs> and that's how the fight starts. But just look at the stress response. You know, the automatic mechanism deeply ingrained in us to survive mortal danger. Imagine being faced by a wild and hungry animal. We might defend ourselves or run away or attack. Now consider this. When we use language with generalizations, judgments, mind reads and so on, we provoke the stress response in the other person. No wonder we get an automatic negative reaction from them. And so the price we pay for that is that we lose their goodwill. They build up resentment towards us and they might lose self-esteem if they agree with our judgments of them. But the kicker is that all those negative feelings that they're generating, they associate with you. When I teach emotionally intelligent communication, I teach just four basic principles. These principles probably take care of about 90% of what you need for emotional intelligence. When you use emotionally intelligent communication, instead of having those automatic reactions, you make a conscious response because you're now aware of your own perceptions, your feelings and your needs. It also means that you'll learn how to accurately hear what other people feel and need, regardless of how they actually express themselves. It means that you understand other people before they understand themselves and you will be able to help them help themselves. Imagine how useful that will be as you teach your children the life skills they'll need to cope with whatever life chucks at them. Let's go back to our true story. And let me give you a little of the background leading up to this particular conversation. This 14-year-old was now in his third secondary school. He'd been excluded from the first two schools and this was his first week in the new school. When we speak, we take shortcuts. We assume the other person will fill in the blanks correctly. So when mum said, how was school? What she really meant was, I love you and want the world for you. I believe education will allow you more choice later in life and I want you to have all the options the world has to give you. I'd love to know school is working out. How was school? How do we listen? Well, we take shortcuts there as well. We don't stop to check we're heading in the right direction. We assume we understand the message. Our teenager heard, how was school? But automatically his mind set him off thinking, nag, 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 she's on my case, nothing I ever do is going to satisfy her, nothing I ever do is going to be good enough for her. 
Feelings will generate behavior in a flash. We talk about having a button pressed, boom, as though you're lighting some blue touch paper and the fireworks suddenly explodes. It's that fast. But what's the purpose of feelings? Feelings are a barometer of whether your needs are being met or not. If you have positive feelings, then some of your needs are being met in that moment. If you're having some negative feelings, it means that some of your needs are not being met in that moment. And that's all feelings are for. If you're feeling hungry, it's your automatic unconscious mind telling you to address your need for food in that moment. If you're feeling hot, it's your unconscious mind telling you to take off a layer and cool down. Your feelings are there to tell you whether your needs are being met or not, and if not, to do something about it, specifically to take an action to fulfill that need in a healthy way. What are needs? What needs are we talking about? Well, we know that human beings need water, shelter, food. That's obvious, isn't it? But did you know that human beings also need connection, belonging, love? They're not icing on the cake. They're real needs and we had better fulfill them. Have you heard of failure to thrive syndrome? It was discovered in the baby orphanages of Eastern Europe a while back. A third of the babies were dying and half of the survivors had mental illnesses and reduced IQ and a compromised immune system. They seemed to have everything they needed, food, water, clothes, beds to sleep in, but one thing they realised these babies didn't have was the affection and physical contact that most babies experience in a normal family environment. Lack of that physical contact resulted in the baby's brains not growing properly. 10,000 years or so ago we lived in caves. It was safe in the cave. Being outside the cave meant that it was only a matter of time before we met a sticky end. Physiologically, we're the same as our ancestors were all those years ago. It means that we're hardwired to belong, to be accepted by our peers, because that's how we stayed in the cave and safe, and it's still how we feel safe now. All of our needs are hardwired. If you're a human being, <laughs> then you have needs. Let's go back to our story. After working with emotionally intelligent communication for a while, our mother went to pick up her son from rugby practice to discover him in the midst of a fracas with other teenagers. The other parents were watching helplessly. Our mum waded in and had a word with one of the boys, whereupon the fight stopped and they began to speak respectfully, not just to her, but to each other too. You can probably imagine the astonishment of the onlookers. How do you think her relationship is with her son now? Now you've had a quick introduction, think of a situation where emotionally intelligent communication will help you too. I hope you found that useful. I'd like to invite you to my workshop where you'll discover the simple four-step process I've been talking about and how it will help you develop emotionally intelligent communication. So if you're interested, go to soundspositive.com forward slash advanced for more information and to book. Thank you very much for listening.